from Deloitte Tax. Welcome to the Tax News and Views podcast. In this podcast series, we talk to specialists from Deloitte Tax about some of the latest business issues and developments. I'm Carrie Falkenhayn, your host for Tax News and Views, and joining me today is Jane Searing. Jane is a leader in Deloitte's Global Center for Excellence in Philanthropy. Jane is also a luminary in the area of taxation of exempt organizations, including private foundations and public charities. Today, we'll talk about some of the trends occurring in the philanthropic world, some options available for fulfilling charitable goals, and what the important considerations are when choosing a philanthropic vehicle. Jane, thanks for being here and welcome to the podcast. Let's go ahead and start by discussing some of the trends occurring in charitable giving and what's driving those trends. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to have this discussion with you today. You're right. There's a lot going on. Um, Part of it is driven by where we are today, where we are as far as, um, you know, COVID having happened in 2020 and, you know, rolling on to into 2021. Um, But philanthropy is not new. It's not new in the U.S. It's not new worldwide. Um, It is something that, you know, I've been doing for more than 30 years. Um, People have a general desire to do good things, you know, they want to help other people. And so oftentimes they have in their minds, I have some excess, I, you know, whether it's a lot or a little, and they have a question of, well, what can I do? And how can I best do that? I'm not surprised that we're seeing an increase in the desire to give right now, given everything that's going on in the world. And I'm sure our audience is familiar with public charities. So what are some of the other things that are available? That's exactly right. So there, everybody is sort of, you, you know, they are familiar with their favorite public charity, or maybe they belong to a religious organization. What we're seeing more frequently now, in addition to thinking about um, a public charity, maybe they want to set up an alternative vehicle where they want to put some money aside today and they want to have it available tomorrow. So there are donor advised funds. That's interesting. What are some of the aspects of a donor advised fund? Only a public charity can sponsor a donor advised fund. Um, Oftentimes they are sponsored by your local community foundation, but there are also public charities that have been set up in the, um, the financial sector by brokerage houses, but they have set up public charities to specifically sponsor donor advised funds. And they're some of the largest um, sponsors of donor advised funds in the country. Um, And they manage the assets in those donor advised funds and donors then move their assets. They're not their money anymore. So they have contributed, they get a charitable contribution at the time that they put the money into a donor advised fund and they only have advisory privileges. The gift is complete when they put the money into the account, but then they have the ability to advise over the investment of those assets and to advise over the redistribution of those assets. So, you know, they may say that I want to put, you know, X number of dollars to the ballet or Y number of dollars to my alumni association or to whatever philanthropic uh, activity they want to distribute to. Generally, they're going to a public charity in the future, but you do have the ability, some donor advised funds specialize in international giving. Um, And so they are able to distribute funds internationally as well through donor advised funds. So they are, uh, they're a great tool if you are redistributing to generally recognized charities, whether they're domestic or international, and um, they tend to be less expensive than some of the other tools. They are a good tool. They're one of the tools in the tool shed though. What are some of the other vehicles that people can think about from a charitable giving perspective? An oldie but a goodie is always the private foundation. So if you are thinking more along the lines of in perpetuity and you have um, substantial resources and somebody's going to ask me, of course, well, what do you think of substantial resource? It's in the millions of dollars, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions. You have substantial resources, enough that you have the ability to hire professional managers or um, an external resource I get it. Private foundations are for substantial contributions. So tell us more. What what are private foundations? A private foundation is a separate new legal entity, often formed as a corporation or a trust. 
And once it's created, um, you actually seek separate exempt status for that entity. It is managed and it doesn't have necessarily a life unless you establish a life for it. Some foundations do um, have a termination date in the future, but they can exist in perpetuity because the donor has ultimate control often over that private foundation because they control the board, or if it's a trust, they can be the sole trustee of that trust um, during their lifetime. The reason people oftentimes select a private foundation is they, this is the ultimate uh, control vehicle. So you put your money into a private foundation, but you still can control it. Because of that, private foundations are subject to significant um, restrictions under the federal tax laws. Under Chapter 42, they're subject to self-dealing re regulations. There is a net investment income tax uh, that is associated with the investment earnings that are earned inside of a private foundation. They're subject to excess business holding rules. Of course, that also does apply to a donor advised fund. There's others. So there's some ones that, you know, if you are interested in medical research, agricultural research, there are other vehicles that are sort of akin to a private foundation, but if you have real resources and you are, um, you're thinking that you wanna do something very specific as we work with uh, our colleagues at the Monitor Institute, and we are going through the, uh, the steps of what are you thinking about doing, you know, discernment of your why. As we work through that, we generally figure out pretty quickly what are the, um, what's the right vehicle? And once we do that, um, it becomes pretty apparent what they're, what the right vehicle, the how of how they're going to do their philanthropy. But that's sort of the fun part of, you know, when they sort of discern what their um, philanthropic journey is going to be and then pull out the right tools to help plug it in and make it successful, sort of building it out for them. It sounds like there's a number of choices depending on the level of control that an individual wants going forward as well as their level of resources to invest. That probably dictates what their choice is. Yeah, you know, and one other thing that we're seeing is probably one of the newer um, options is sometimes they don't even wanna go the tax exempt route. They'll actually create a, uh, a separate pool of resources, whether they use a trust or an LLC, some sort of a pass-through entity. Um, and they create it as a, it's a, a named organization, whether they create it as a, a benefit corporation or an LLC or um, even a, an L3C in some states have that, which is a, a low profit limited liability company, um, again, where they control it, but it's completely private. It's not tax exempt, but they can do anything from scholarships to impact investing so if our listeners are thinking about increasing their philanthropic activities, where would you have them start? Generally, the best place to start is with an inventory of where are you now and always start with why. Are you happy going alone if that's what you've been doing? Where do you want to be in a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? So also sort of future casting. And so a lot of it is where are you now? Where do you want to go? And, you know, how do you get from here to there? What are some of the questions that would be important to answer in determining a strategy going forward? So once they sort of have discerned what they're thinking about as their strategy, then we start asking the questions of, are you going to go it alone? Are you really going to fund this 100% by yourself? Or are you going to be working with other philanthropists? So are you going to um, going to be seeking other outside funders. It might lead you to set up an entity where other people will be contributing. And so they, instead of setting up, for example, a private foundation, will set up a public charity because other people want to give to the things that they, are, they care about. So the number of anticipated donors is an important consideration. Do the activities of the charity also make a difference in the structure? Thinking about the activities, if you are ultimately going to be doing, for example, um, agricultural research, um, there's no reason for that to be a private foundation, why you don't need to shackle yourself with those rules, you qualify as a type of public charity, even if it's privately funded, and you're still controlling it, um, you don't have to be limited to the rules that are, um, that are imposed upon a private foundation. 
And so we've also had people that are basically setting up a school that is privately funded. And if it's a school and it meets all the criteria of a school, even if it's privately funded, it can be a public charity. That's something where we've, we've seen organizations, they were, it's a school and it's a public charity, even though it initially started out with one benefactor. So where are the resources coming from? Where are they going to? Who's actually doing the work? Where's the expertise? Those are the questions we tend to work through in those early phases. Um, And where is it going to be conducted? Is it all domestic or is it going to be international? Those are some of the important things. The other is, is is there going to be any lobbying or political activities? Those are some of those really important initial questions because they're foundational to the type of entity you're going to want to use. Because if you're going to be involved in lobbying and political activities, that's going to be a determinative of the type of organization you're going to be able to select from. Jane, lots to think about, but all for good purpose. It's it's got to be exciting to work with people and organizations with a passion for charitable giving. It really is. These are people that are changing the world and it's really exciting to see them with their passions. They are the change agents and they're people that are making a huge impact on our world. And it's fun to watch them and, and, see them bringing their dreams into reality. It's really exciting. Jane, thank you for sharing the information with our audience today. As I said, lots to think about. Thank you. So thank you for that. And until next time, this has been Tax News and Views.